Bruna, Bruna, Bruna. 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 Oh, I'm all right. Mm. Mm. Nice to see you. Okay, we're going to start. That was my mic test. At least I know you can hear me now. Just wait for the final entrance to choose a seat. And there go the doors. Okay, good morning, everybody. Um, Welcome to the Future Lawyer Summit 2018. Uh, my name is Daniel Pollock. I want to introduce myself. Uh, I'm rather amusingly uh, labelled in the brochure or the catalogue or the whatever you want to call it today as an industry veteran. Uh, I've only got myself to blame for that. Originally, I was uh, CIO of DLA Piper when I was asked to chair this event, and then I said to the organisers, well, I'm leaving, so you'll have to call me something else. For example, industry veteran, meaning it as a joke, of course. Uh, <laughs> Anyway, the next thing I know, it's, it's there in black and white. So I am an industry veteran. I'm an old man. I'm currently unemployed. Uh, I can recommend a period of unemployment, by the way, if you can afford it. Um, so that's me. Uh, I think we ought to introduce you to each other. So uh, I hope you don't find this too sixth form. But uh, just, just look around you and introduce yourself to someone that you've not met before, would you? Okay, well done. Well done. Th thanks, everybody. Uh, one of the great things about this conference is that you've got plenty of space to talk to each other. Uh, I mean, time, of course, time and space. If you look at the schedule for the day, there's plenty of time for you to uh, meet each other, old friends, new friends, and to spend time with the uh, exhibitors and so on. So please do take full advantage of doing that. But let's just keep going on the introductions thing. Uh, someone's already holding up a five-minute sign. I mean, oh, my goodness. Right. Um, do I need to... Okay, no, I'm, I've been let off. Right. Um, let's just do a quick demographic -y thing. How many of you work for providers of legal services, law firms and the like? Stick your hand up. Okay. How many of you work for buyers or consumers of legal services, sometimes called in-house or corporate? Yeah? A smattering, a smattering. How many of you work for organisations that supply stuff to the legal services market? So technologists and uh, uh, software and blah, blah, blah. Okay, so a good slug of you. Fine. And the killer question, how many of you are prepared to admit to being a lawyer? Okay, well, I, you know, uh, ten years ago, any summit of any sort that was about innovation in law, uh, it was all the non-lawyers who rocked up to try and work out how the hell to get lawyers to change. And so it's uh, fantastic to see such a, a spread of lawyers in the room. So it's, uh, it's a good, diverse group, and I'm going to talk a little bit about diversity and inclusion uh, at the conclusion of my opening remarks. Uh, so let me just give you a quick guide to the day, uh, more a physical guide than a content guide. So you're in the main hall now, that's obvious. The... Uh, food and exhibitors are out that way on the right, so you'll be served lunch uh, near where the exhibitors are. So please take the opportunity to eat and observe what's going on there. You will also notice if you look in your timetable for the day that there is an innovation stage. The innovation stage is out of this room and on the left. Okay, And you'll find, I think, that there's a session by Brochet uh, in the first break and a session by Volters Kluwer in one of the afternoon breaks. Those are open to everybody. Please do attend those if they're of interest to you. Um, fire. Got to make a fire announcement. There are no fire drills 
uh, planned for today. So if you hear fire announcements, they are for real. Uh, the fire announcement process here is that it is actually spoken. You will not hear an alarm. You'll hear instructions. Follow the instructions. The, uh, the venue staff are fire marshals. They will guide you to safety and to the assembly point. If you want to know where the assembly point is, it is in Bartholomew Close, so around the back uh, near Bart's. So that's the, that's the fire announcement out of the way. Um, I said I would talk about diversity and inclusion. I'm pleased to say that I'm actually looking at what looks like a much more diverse group of people, certainly from a gender point of view, than two experiences that I've had uh, when speaking at conferences earlier this year. The first one was the Glen Eagles Legal IT Conference, and it was a sea of white middle-aged men with about two women, maybe five women. A couple of weeks later, I went to the Gartner CIO, European CIO Summit, as did Bruna, who's laughing. And I'm telling you, it was an ocean, an ocean of grey-suited, white-shirted, white, middle-aged men. And when I saw this, I thought, we've got to do something. Um, now, it looks to me, looking in the audience, that we're making a lot more progress uh, in the broader legal sector than we are in the legal IT sector. But it did make me think that all of us in legal IT and elsewhere, because I know you're not all legal technologists, need to do something about diversity and inclusion. And it's not just about gender, it's not just about skin colour or race, it's about socio-economic, uh, it's about the way you hire, it's about the way you promote people, it's about the way we bring our kids up so that we are not uh, gender identifying their careers. I don't know if you know, but the rates at which women are going into technology careers is going down, it's not going up. So we're, we're in a pretty bad place. now. I, I, I'm not saying there's not much I can do, and shame on me for only realising this uh, in my swan song at DLA, but we're going to try and do a little bit of something today. So we have uh, three diversity and inclusion champions in the audience today, Bruna Polici, who's there, Teresa Snyman, I don't know where she is, and Lorraine Brennan. They're all high achievers in uh, the legal industry, particularly the legal IT industry, and they are going to come round during the day in the networking breaks, and they're going to nag you to think about what you personally are doing uh, to further the diversity and inclusion agenda within your organisation. And in fact, we're encouraging everybody to make a diversity and inclusion pledge. Don't worry, we won't read them out, we won't hold you to them. Uh, but it would be really great if everybody today and may I say, particularly the white men, because white men are the ones who seem to have got hold of all the power in, in our society. So it would be great if everybody would just spend a few minutes today, just think about what you personally can do to uh, improve diversity and inclusion in our industry. What can you do to engage with your diversity initiatives within your organisation, to change the way in which you hire, to reach back early into, earlier into life and do stuff with schools? Uh, the sad thing is that a lot of the die is cast very early on in schools. It's not good enough just to go to schools when kids are 15 and you're trying to persuade them to pursue a career in the legal sector. I don't claim to have any of the answers. This is about awareness. Please do spend some time thinking about it. Okay. So, let's make a start on the content of the day. Uh, our first session, how else could you start uh, a conference on the future of legal services but by talking about artificial intelligence, right? Uh, you can barely move uh, but to see in magazines, news articles, Twitter, everywhere else, obsessive commentaries about AI. I'm pleased to say that the early ridiculous stuff about robots and artificial general intelligence taking us over, uh, I think that that's faded away and is being replaced by an understanding that the application of artificial intelligence in the law is about applying it to specific problems that people genuinely have, rather than hoping that by buying some AI thing, something miraculous will happen. So. I hope I've not ruined what the panel are going to say, but I'm going to invite the panel up now. The panel is chaired by Richard Tromans of Artificial Lawyer, and there are two other members, Emily Foges, who's CEO of Luminance, which is a, an AI provider, and Marco Imperiali, who is an innovation officer in an Italian law firm. I bet there's not many of you, Marco. So if you could all... Well, there you are. So, and Victoria Duxbury, of course, is the fourth member of that group. She's uh, an associate at BCLP. How, how easy is it to say BCLP now? Bright. 
Bryant Cave, Leighton, Paisner. Yeah. Well, when, when DLA and Piper Rudnick and Gray Carey first merged in 2005, there was a, a significant period when the name of the firm was DLA, Piper Rudnick, Gray Carey. Uh, I refused to buy a domain name and use a domain name. I said, you're not having that, we'll have DLA Piper. So obviously I claim that that's why DLA Piper is so called. So panel, please come to the front and start your session. Thank you very much. Let's hear it for them, thank you. Good morning, hi Emily. Good morning. Hi Victoria. Um, I think I'll stay here actually. Uh, hi everybody. Um, so today we're going to kick off with what hopefully is a very sort of sensible overview of some of the practical applications of using legal AI technology. Um, I do two things. I run a blog called Artificial Lawyer, which tracks the things that are going on in the market. I'm also a consultant through my own business to lawyers about innovation. Um, we're going to try and get into some of the practical details. We're very lucky to have a very interesting audience um, panel with us. Starting on the far right there, um, we've got Emily Fodges from Luminance, which is a legal AI company based in the UK. Uh, we've got Victoria, as mentioned, who is from a law firm, who has been using artificial intelligence since about 2015, 2016? Yeah, well, it feels longer than that. And I think if you remember, if you, <laughs> if you remember the sort of how things started in terms of the media coverage, um, BLP, before it merged, was one of the first law firms to publicly sort of come out and say they were using uh, an AI system. And we've got Marco Imperiali, who is currently piloting a system in Italy, but they haven't made their mind up. And perhaps that represents the position of many of you in the audience. So first of all, Emily, could you just introduce yourself in a bit more detail and tell the audience about what you do and we'll just go down the line. Sure, so um, my name is Emily Foges and I'm the CEO of Luminance which uses the latest developments in machine learning technology from the University of Cambridge to read, understand contracts and then learn from the interaction between the lawyer and the platform to just get better and better at doing that. Cool, thank you. Well, what's your role? Yeah, so my role is that, that I head up real estate knowledge development at Brian Cave, Lake and Paisner. Got it out there. Um, so that's very much about giving the, the lawyers the tools that they need in order to do the work. And a lot of what we're doing at the moment is about process and efficiencies um, and about knowledge sharing. And again, that's not just across the lawyers, but it's the client facing part as well. So that's, that's why I'm here. Fantastic. And Marco? Um, my, my role is kind of unique because I'm not a partner, I'm just uh, an associate in an Italian law firm that is called LCA. And, uh, I'm basically uh, the guy, the lawyer that has to address all the new things, whether it's artificial intelligence, blockchain, cryptocurrencies, uh, and so on and so forth. So my firm is pretty aware that a revolution is coming and uh, wants to be kind of involved in uh, what's, what's going on in the field. And I'm the one, you know, proposing to the partners some solutions and the partners will be the one that will decide what to do. Fantastic. So that's great. So we've got a nice spread there. So we've got a vendor, one of probably the most well-known vendors in the UK. We've got a very large law firm uh, who's already been using AI systems. And we've got a smaller law firm who's kind of thinking it through. So to start off with, let's, let's start off with something very basic. Um, we can start off with perhaps Victoria, because you've been using these systems. What is the real value to a law firm in using an AI system, such as for doc review? Well, what is the real benefit? Um, so obviously the, there are a number, as you'd like to hope. Um, the first one, I think, is, is reliability of speed. So when a transaction comes in, uh, and, and my expertise is obviously real estate, uh, you can definitively know that you can get from point A to at least point B, depending on how far you're going, within a time frame. And that is regardless of what else is coming in through the door, of whether it's five o'clock on a bank holiday weekend, um, of whether actually we had 10 other massive shopping centre deals come in earlier in the week, um, you know that the system will allow you to get over those resourcing humps that you might have had in the past and, and that hasn't involved having a room of paralegals in a dark basement just waiting for the next thing to come in. Um, so, so that's one of the key benefits. Um, uh, the other 
major benefit from the lawyer side looking out is that um, as, as a trainee, um, those of you lawyers in the room, um, you might remember sort of the late nights and the excitement the first night you got to recharge your pizza and, and your taxi back to the firm. But um, <laughs> that excitement, in, in my memory anyway, didn't, didn't always last that long. Um, by using AI, there's still pizza um, and the odd taxi, but um, it allows lawyers to really concentrate on the commercial value in the work that they're doing. Um, so I know we're not meant to be talking about robots, but this is about actually taking the kind of robot out of the lawyer, if you like, and trying to get rid of some of that mundane kind of eye-watering comparison extraction work and allowing the lawyers to kind of use their brains to find those nitty-gritty commercial points that the clients are really after. Absolutely, absolutely. Fantastic, thank you. And Emily, as someone who runs an AI company, what do you see as the key value? What value are you providing to the law firms? So I think um, something I've been thinking a lot about recently is that um, you know, law firms do have problems that need to be solved and the AI is there to solve those problems and I think there's been in the last couple of years a little bit of a tendency to think we, you know, we must do AI, we must do blockchain, we must do innovation, um, whereas actually all of those things are probably going to fail unless you're trying to solve a real life problem. <laughs> yeah. So you know, I think you know, where the, you know, the problem that you know, we're solving is exactly the one that you talk about there, I think, which is that you know, there is just way too much documentation documentation now for a team of lawyers to sit in a darkened room with cold towels over their heads and, and crack through it. And they, if they do do that, they're going to lose their concentration because it's so repetitive and so boring. So you know, to use the technology to get through that first pass and understand what's in the documents in the early days of the transaction and actually in the first hour have an understanding of what's in there and what that might mean, then means that the lawyers are using their brains and using their legal training. And I think increasingly when we talk to trainees in firms as well, we see a real kind of divergence between what they learned at law school and what they're excited about and the reason why they went into the law and then what actually they have to do for the first few years. Um, and that can be demoralizing and some of them leave and some of them just become very repetitive robots and that's not good for the firm. So I think you know, the technology is available now, the technology has come of age, it's no longer painful to use um, and so actually to use that to get the best value for your client is what the technology is there for. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, it reminds me of a line from Eric Schmidt, uh, one of the co-founders of Google, uh, who famously said about 10 years ago that, you know, in the future, about well, 20 years ago, that in the future, computers will do what computers are good at and people will do yeah. what people are good at. And if you use that analogy in the legal sector, pretty much yeah. that's what you just said. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, Peter Volquist, one of the co-founders of Raven, the legal AI company, put it in a slightly more amusing way uh, at a conference in Scandinavia recently when he said to a bunch of lawyers, um, your lawyers don't be tools, which <laughs> raised the tether from the audience, but uh, the Scandinavian guys didn't get it. But um, anyway, you get the message. So, uh, Marco, you're in a slightly different position. I mean, the partners are interested in AI. Are they, you know, as was alluded to earlier, do they see it as, as this sort of big, shiny robot that's going to solve their problems, or do they understand its actual value? Well, I am the one that has to you know, articulate the value of artificial intelligence and frame the value of artificial intelligence to partners. So shifting the concept all the robots are going to take our jobs to it's not AI versus human lawyers, but it's AI with uh, human lawyers. And I am the one spreading the seeds. And um, I would, I agree with everything you said about uh, the strategic value that uh, artificial in intelligence can offer and shifting from, you know, automating stuff to, uh, you know, do what the lawyer should do, which is, you know, offering value to the clients. But on the other hand, I would not underestimate it, um, two factors. The first one is that um, kind of uh, instructing lawyers, especially partners who are gently uh, risk averse and you know, looking backward instead of looking forward because, you know, stuck with a binding precedent to, you know, to do something new, to change, to train with the machines, is kind of a fostering uh, an innovation culture. And I think that in his age and seeing uh, what law firms will do in five to ten years, there will be 
a, a, a real uh, um, a, a real factor, and secondly, a kind of a shifting what uh, what's the culture of discipline because, especially in you know in practice something like M and A. Um, the fact of spending long hours of due diligence and you know having pizzas and charging a taxi on on the law firms is kind of a value on its own. So it's how we can substitute that kind of discipline with a different kind of discipline. And you know, training the machines can be uh, one of the way we will address them. Well, let's. Okay, that's that's a good introduction. Thank you. Uh, we'll we'll come back to the training point very shortly. Um, in terms of how it's changed for the firm, again, Victoria, I mean, have things actually changed? I mean, you know, there's the old, you know, red herring about the end of lawyers and so forth, maybe the end of paralegals, perhaps. But have, I mean, you've been using systems for, what, say, three years. Yep. Have you noticed any impact um, in terms of numbers and so forth? And how are you actually internally using it? Is it a bunch of, is it, do you have like a sort of special elite group of associates who can play with the AI system? Or how, how does that work? Um, as I think is inevitable in any in any business structure, the, those that are that are keen on the innovation and that are looking for ways in which to use it, and those who are, um, are more tied to their pen and paper and all the rest, um, at, at BLP as was, and, and now at BCLP in real estate, we've got just to give an example. So the, the two tools, one one you've already mentioned, um, and this was very much about finding a solution to problems. Problems where we were potentially, you know, either losing money or up against it on deals where we could, didn't have the time or the capacity, um, to, or the manpower to actually get things get things over the line. So, um, Lonald, as we call it affectionately, um, was about light obstruction notices. So, um, in the city, obviously all the skyscrapers going up, you have rights to light issues, um, and that involves analysing reams and reams of title documents to see who might be affected around your development. Um, and this was something that our team of paralegals at the time were doing in a dark room. Um, it was taking a team of them, say, about three weeks to go through the average kind of process. And you're talking about thousands and, and thousands of titles and notices all being pulled together. By going out, in fact, to um, Raven, who were possibly one of the biggest names at, at the time, um, we said, well, this is our problem. Can you help us build a solution? And the solution then was to go out to, um, to build the tool and teach the tool to read title documents, um, <clears throat> to seamlessly check any corporate entities within those title documents against Companies House, again, within seconds, uh, to pull those back into a database that we would then use mail merge to create um, the notices that were required. And that suddenly meant that you could review hundreds of titles to produce thousands of notices, and you'd only need two people and one day. Uh, so that's against a whole massive room of people in three weeks. And suddenly, the, the mass on that suddenly stacks up, and you've got a happy client, um, and you've got a, an overheated photocopier, but uh, sorry, a printer, because it's reaming out literally um, in the first example, I think, on, on 100 titles, um, 2,500 notices would be produced, literally, you know, within minutes, within hours. And, and so suddenly that's a game changer in terms of the product and the service you can offer the client. Interesting. And I mean, Emily, I mean, are you seeing the same kind of thing that you're seeing changes in working <laughs> practices when law firms start using luminance? So I think it varies massively. Um, we had um, a really kind of quite striking anecdote last week, um, which was um, a, a European firm where, you know, it, the only technical constraint that you have if you're using Luminance is you have to have Google Chrome. You know, it's something that you just use in your browser and you just get on and you use it. So there are very, there are very, there are no barriers to getting on and using it. However, there is a, you know, a cultural change I think for lawyers in you know, moving from a paper-based way of working to a more technology-based way of working. And even though we're used to using technology more and more in our everyday lives, I think there is a sort of, you know, a sort of comfort in working on paper. One of my um, client onboarding team came back from a European firm last week and said that. They They'd gone to do some training with the team, um, and the team was, you know, sitting, sort of having a sort of war room session, and so they were doing doing some work on a live transaction, and she was just guiding them and helping them and asking them, answering their questions. And a young lawyer in the room suddenly got up and ran out of the room, 
and um, so she went to see if he was all right and he was having a little breakdown actually having a bit of a meltdown because wow. he was going where's all the paper where's all the paper and actually this is somebody who likes paper he likes to work with paper and to have a highlighter pen and that's sort of why he's doing the job so I think we mustn't underestimate that that even though the technology is so sophisticated now that you don't need to train it you don't need to do all of that work there is still a cultural change you know you are moving to using something that's much more like using your iPhone or using an app or something you'd use in everyday life but actually I think you know to your point about you know getting partners in the firm to understand that there is a different way of working when the way that you work as law firms has been very profitable for very long time and it's not actually fundamentally broken mm -hmm. so yeah so making that change is quite interesting um, but I think in terms of how um, how we see organizations adopt technology it varies massively it depends on the size of the firm um, you know I think very organically often works very well you know just take one project take one transaction solve the problem on that transaction and then use that to demonstrate to everybody else the benefits that they could have that can work very well but in a very large firm it probably doesn't because probably that one transaction will be happening somewhere where where nobody sees it. Mm. So in a very large firm, we see the kind of, you know, big rollout projects which are let's get our support team into a position where they're doing all of the support for luminance rather than luminance doing the support for luminance we'd rather keep all of that in house so much more of a structured rollout it really just depends okay and is it i mean something that, that crops up a lot i mean are ai systems that can review many many documents fundamentally just a volume play i mean if you're a medium sized law firm in the uk i'm sure there's probably a couple here is it just not something you should be bothered with i mean is it for smaller firms if you've got to review say 100 documents, is mm. it even worth it? I mean, I know both Victoria and Emily, do you mm. want to... I think for smaller firms, it definitely level, levels the playing field because these smaller firms don't have the access to, you know, a whole swathe of trainees who are sitting there really using due diligence as a training exercise. Um, so, yeah, we've got a lot of really small firms actually using Luminance. I mean, some which have got two partners, for oh. example. Um, so I, I think it is a leveller. It is a way of smaller firms punching above their weight, potentially. Okay. Um, in terms of volume, obviously, if you've got one contract, there's no point using AI to review one contract. Mm. You know, it, it, the whole point of it is to cope with the volume of documents. Unless, I guess, you're a GC, because there are systems right. where <laughs> yeah. a GC might have the same type of document you know, every mm. 10 minutes coming into their yeah. Yeah. email box, yeah, yeah. and yeah. if they can just like, zap it through, like Thought River, for example, I guess mm. that would be useful. I mean, uh, Victoria, yeah. well, how do you see? Well, yeah, it's interesting you make that comment, because I see it not just as a... Um, a due diligence tool, if you like. So if you take the example of a shopping centre, um, comes in, you do all your reviews, you present it to the client, client advisor, they're all very happy. But then from that point on, you're introducing new tenants, it's a living asset. And if you've got your setup through your, with the help of your AI, you suddenly have a consistent way of keeping yeah. the knowledge around that product, uh, be it commercial contract or a, a piece of land or whatever it might be live and, and you can use various other tools then to remind you about various points in those contracts and, and it isn't something which is just created for that single transaction and then put on a shelf, gathers dust until maybe you want to sell it 10 years down the line. Mm. It, it's, it's living information yeah. and, and management tools and, and that consistency as you say would allow a GC or it allows anyone who wants to be working in an efficient and consistent manner to use that templating yeah. to keep them on track. Well, let's, well, I, well two, you've raised two good questions there. I love the idea AI is a living asset inside the business. That's great. Um, what are the clients saying? Do you even talk to the clients about it? Do the clients even need to know? Or are the clients saying, oh, that's interesting. Why don't we just buy it and now we don't need you? Do you, I mean, how is that, uh, so, um, Emily, how, is that, uh, how does that work? Uh, we see Who, that play out in all sorts of different ways, actually. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, the, the weirdest one of which, I'm full of weird anecdotes this morning, sorry, but the weirdest, <laughs> weirdest one of which was a phone call we got from a large energy company in Florida who rang us and said, so our um, advisors have told us they're using luminance on these transactions and we want to have a demonstration so we understand what that means and their advisors were not our customer. So the advisor was telling their client that they were using technology which they hadn't actually bought, which put us in a really difficult position. Yes, of course, we'll give you a demo. 
<laughs> yeah, um, that was odd. So I think there's definitely that sort of dynamic with mm. clients sort of saying, you know, I need to see that you're doing something to, you know, to make the way that you work more effective and more efficient, and I need to see that happening. But is there like a race? And also, <laughs> let's bring in the big four who are all using AI systems, like PwC has got a massive centre in Belfast, yep. and as I understand they've got licences to almost every AI review system on the planet, and they just slot them in whenever they need them. And then you've got all the LPOs, um, Thomson Reuters, their managed legal services arm, they've also just brought in uh, eBrevia. So who who is the best place to do this work? I mean, um, Victoria, I mean, obviously you'll say the law firm should be doing it. <laughs> I, I mean, I think from, from our experience, we have particular um, clients and, and particularly GCs at, our, at some of our clients who are really interested in this stuff. I mean, they'll, they'll come to conferences. Um, they want to know, as you say, a little bit like CSR. They want to know that their law firms are, are kind of following the same policies and innovations and, and that kind of holistic thinking that they are as a, as a business because that's what kind of makes you or helps you work well together. Um, whether they they need to know or they're interested in knowing at what point we've pushed the button and whether we're using Luminance or Kira or Raven at any given point. I think no. I, I think they just want to know that we're doing the work in the most efficient, timely, cost-effective um, way that we can and that that interplay yeah. between the AI and the lawyers, it, mm. you know, that we've got it right and we're, we're doing it to their best advantage. Okay, well, you, you just, sorry, Mark, Mark No, I would, I would just <coughs> rely also on the fact that uh, it's also a matter of why the clients are interested in law firm using artificial intelligence. Mm. Is it because, you know, they can save some uh, they can save some money, or it's because the law firm they are partnering with should be innovative as much as they are. Mm -hmm. And I think that uh, that's a crucial factor. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, indeed, indeed. Uh, um, I mean, as you say, with, with the CSR example, I mean, your, your clients want you to emulate them to some degree, don't they? Right. Um, you, you mentioned money, and I was going to leave this till later, but let's talk about it now. I mean, money is a question I get asked about a lot. Um, the assumption from people who don't know much about the area is that AI systems are ridiculously expensive. And we all want to know that's not true. So first of all, if you could just make a very, we, we don't have to get into numbers, but if you could just give some indications. Uh, and then secondly, how do you charge this out? How do you charge out something that is effectively a digital service? How do you, maybe start off with Emily on costs. Um, yeah, so um, our approach to pricing um, the technology has always been consumption based. So, on, you know, so really you treat it like a trainee. <coughs> so you treat the AI the same way you treat your human resources, which is to say, you know, we've, we've used it for this many days on this deal with this volume of data and then, you know, that, it, that amount of money um, represents the value that you get because the system is reading and understanding the contracts. Um, so, you know, you can then tie that back to the client's invoice if you want to. Um, that obviously works for, um, for a law firm. For an in-house legal team, it's a very different thing because mm. for an in-house legal team, like you said, you know that sort of on that sort of real-time monitoring where you've got a volume of contracts which are you know, living in that repository, and Luminance is the repository for the contracts. Mm. And then you know there's the monitoring that goes on when an NDA is, is generated or comes in, and it's comparing those to the rest and creating an alert that says you know this what this doesn't look right. Mm. Um, then that obviously is, can't be priced on a consumption basis. That just doesn't work. So then it's much more of a sort of monthly license fee. But it, if, so uh, beyond the sort of the, the quantity of data you use, like you might yeah. say in the same way that you use a telephone, um, your annual licenses would be sort of family size saloon type prices, or are we talking sort of Maserati type? It prices? depends on the organisation because yeah. you know it depends. I mean, yeah, really, it all comes back to you know, how much documentation are you expecting the system to read and understand? Because yeah. yeah, that's where the cost is. That's where all the processing goes. But if, so. if a smaller firm, I saw someone nodding when I mentioned yeah. smaller firms earlier. Yeah. If a smaller firm was interested, yeah. I mean, we're looking at the price of a mid-level associate kind of thing, or on a transaction. Well, uh, to, to have an annual license, for example? Um, so for a law firm, you wouldn't have an annual license. Okay. You, yeah, you wouldn't have, you, so you don't pay anything if you're not using it. You pay what you use. You only pay when you're using it. Okay. So, you know, it would come to, you know, like, a, you know, a, a, a sort of a point percentage probably of the value of the transaction to the law firm, put okay. it that way, Fantastic. to use the technology. Does that work? That's perfect. Thank you. So that segues nicely to Victoria. So how do you build this stuff out? So you've paid for this service, yeah. you've done a piece of work for the clients, and also maybe just mention fixed fees in all of this. Yeah. How does that work? How do you flip it around and cover your costs? 
and so, make a profit. Yeah, well, so at the moment, our experience has been perhaps because the biggest use classes have, have be, biggest use cases have been in real estate is 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 on a fixed fee. So if you're buying a a building for a certain amount of money, there is a value that. The, to that transaction and the client will expect to pay a certain percentage point on, or, well, there's a certain percentage they'll pay for their acquisition cost, of which part is, is to legal. So again, how that is sliced and diced within the firm, whether that equates to 2,000 trainee hours or 1,000 trainee hours and 1,000 hours of Luminous or Kira, actually it is kind of beside the point for the client, but it's very important for us internally to know how you know how we are valuing the tools that we're using, because in the same way, if, if you strip it all back and think about um, email, your IT spend, your photocopying, your scanning spend, this is just a tool that you are using in order to get to the end product. And I don't, you would, you wouldn't expect well. <laughs> You wouldn't expect to charge for your Outlook account, for exactly. example. Yeah. And um, this pen. <laughs> well, yeah, you might. Yeah. The, the whole photocopying, scanning, yeah. you know, that that debate maybe rumbles on at a low level. But but this is about how you are creating the service that your client is willing to pay for, and to give it a more of a, a sort of consumer analogy, you know, if you're expecting a certain service, say from Amazon Prime, or you, you expect to be able to track your goods from factory to, to the, your front door, you, you don't expect to have to pay for that. that. That's just an added service. That's just the way that the world's going and the way in which you expect your service to be delivered. Yeah. Um, you don't expect to see that tracking cost on your invoice when it comes through. It's just something that you that will now happen and gets you from from A to B. Absolutely. This idea of AI is integral. I mean, you see that with Google. I mean, Google is an AI system. Most people don't really think about that, but it's a machine learning system that's learning every time you put a search query in. And obviously, Google never charges you for that. You know, it's just it's built in. Um, one of the things I'm particularly interested in is, and I don't know if you've got knowledge of this, but would you say that using an AI system on a fixed fee piece of work will increase your overall profits? Depends on the piece of work. Mm. Yeah. Because I mean, that's. A, I mean, if you can sell but, that, then yeah. you can sell the partners anything. We well, hear this correct. anecdotally from our customers, yeah. where they've been able to hang on to some work, which otherwise they would have been undercut mm. by an LPO or something. So they've been able to keep that part of the work for that client, yeah. um, which they otherwise wouldn't be able be able to afford to do. So yes. we do hear those stories. Yeah, it, it definitely um, changes the face, and this has been changing for for a few years. But say ten years ago, there was certainly. Um, uh, a model out there which you, we used to call waterfalling, where the city, say, you know, the magic circle firms, maybe the silver circle firms, would get a piece of work in, they'd, they'd carve off the, the top dollar, um, you know, the actual corporate nitty gritty of, of the transaction, and then the DD would get shipped out to the regions. Um, and I, I was in the regions at, at that point, so I do, <laughs> so I do remember it. I, I think that model is now dead because any one firm can do everything mm -hmm. in, in the round and, and it makes sense for firms to, uh, to hang on to that work and do the holistic work on the deal for the clients so that they have the full pitch and so they can go on and do the asset management and, mm -hmm. and, and just deliver up uh, to the client across the board. Interesting. And in Italy, I mean, are the Italian lawyers attracted to this idea they're going to make more money? Is that...? Uh, it, Italy is such a unique place. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, for many, many reasons. And j j just give me a couple of minutes to, um, to draw the landscape. We have 240,000 lawyers for a 60 uh, million citizen country, which means that only in Lombardy, which is the region where I'm working in Milan, you know, and we have more lawyers than in the entire France. And uh, yeah, no joking. <laughs> really? And uh, I would say the five to seven thousand lawyers of these two hundred forty thousand are the ones, uh, you know, in international firms or Italian firms dealing with international clients, and uh, they have, you know, a knowledge management system and uh, big M&A volumes. And these five to seven thousand lawyers working for more or less one hundred law firms are providing a ninety percent of money to the. Um, 
a revenue pension system for lawyers. So five to 7,000 lawyers are you know, um, invoicing the 90%. Yeah, yeah. so so they're absolutely loaded. I mean, yeah, <laughs> and so of this <laughs> five to seven thousand lawyers, there's a lot of interns and mm -hmm. a, a, lots of bouts about you know artificial intelligence and you know and how we can uh, you know use luminance or Kira for due diligence kind of stuff, and the uh, other you know two hundred thirty plus thousand are not speaking English, so I think that speaking about artificial intelligence it's mm -hmm. a little bit too early. Yeah, yeah. Well, it, it is it is hard. Although interestingly, Slaughter and May, Freshfields, Clifford Chance, and, and you might look at those firms and say, well, these guys are loaded, the partners are raking the money in, mm. they don't need any change to anything. And yet, strangely, these firms have been very fast adopters mm. um, because they do a lot of, as you were just mentioning, high value work, but also a lot of process work. And they don't really want to lose the process work because that damages your client relationship, the stickiness. So it makes a lot of sense if they can use AI systems. Uh, also, it protects. Um, some of the recruitment initiatives, which is to keep the good people in the firm. Because if you have to do three or four years of really boring work, there is a tendency to then want to leave. I mean, most of the legal tech companies I know were started by a Magic Circle associate who got tired of doing doc review and then walked out and created a company. But anyway, so we're just coming towards the end before, and I'm going to try and give you 15 minutes of questions if you'd like them. Um, just one last question, a very thorny question, which is training training of systems, which Emily wants to talk about for definite. So f let's start off with Emily's views on how do you train an AI system and do you even need to train an AI system? Yeah. So it depends on the AI system. So not all AI is created equal, right? And I think you know, there are legacy technologies where there's a very intensive activity required of you to go and do a training activity and effectively build the rules or recipes or something you know, for the system to be able to understand what you're looking at. And very often you're doing that for a particular use case, which means it's only useful for that use case. So you know, like all AI, you know, like Google Maps, you know, legal technology comes of age as well and gets to a stage where using a blend of supervised and unsupervised machine learning learning, you know, Luminance will learn from you. It learns from the lawyer in the, in the throes of a live transaction. And I think you know, a lot of firms... Could, could, could you just explain that? Cause, yeah. Uh, who knows what unsu unsupervised machine learning is? Okay. About half. Yeah. Okay, good. Yeah. Okay, do you want to yeah. just explain that just a little bit more deeply? Right. So, um, so just as an example, so you know, when I first when I first founded Luminance, we all of us were English. All of the people who worked there were actually, you know, from either from Cambridge or from London. Um, and yet, our first customers were Norwegian, French, and Dutch. Um, and the reason for that is that what Luminance is doing is it's finding patterns in lang language and it's comparing patterns in language and finding standards and deviations, and then learning from the lawyer as the lawyer applies meaning to those patterns in the language. So the very very best way for Luminance to learn from you is to learn from your real life work, from what you're doing every day. Um, rather than go in and do, I mean, if you try and go in and do an artificial training sort of session and say, I'm going to train Luminous to recognize this, it probably won't work very well because it's going to learn from sort of artificial, you know, humans will try and sort of overthink it and I'm going to give it this example and this example because these are extremes and therefore Luminance will learn everything in between. And mm. It's actually designed to learn from you as you work. So but how does that work in practice? So, okay, so um, a client approaches a law firm, yeah. says, here's a big M&A transaction, please go off and do the M&A yeah. review. You. Um, the law firm hasn't used Luminance before, yep. first time on yep. a real transaction. Yeah. They've got a spot, change of control clause, international yeah. arbitration clauses. Yep. Uh, yeah. You just they just go off and use it and Yeah. Well so yeah, you know, so I think so so some of those things are pre built. So, you know, some of those obvious things like change of control in some lang languages we've built them in ready to go mm. to sort of get you started, but obviously not in Norwegian and certainly not with our first customer. So in that case what they were doing was looking at the contracts and looking at you know, looking at the different types of contracts and applying those labels as they went as they went through. Still saves fifty percent of your time even when you're doing that and then obviously gets faster as that stuff builds in. Because I think probably a good way to describe it is if you think Think not about M&A due diligence. So M&A due diligence is pretty codified already for lawyers, right? You know, I'm going to look for change of control is something that you know, most people will do. If you think about something like Brexit, you know, who knows what you're looking for in your contracts? You don't know. Nobody knows. All you know is you know how your organisation works and what those contracts are likely to say. So you know, Luminous will save you a lot of time on an activity like that because you're going in and you're reading contracts. So you're not away from the contracts. You're not handing over control to the machine. You're using the machine to support you and speed you up. 
Mm. So it's an exercise like that where there are no rules, there are no pre-built, there are no provisions that you can necessarily assume you're going to go and look for. But you have to say what you're looking for, presumably. Yeah. So yeah. So when you when you're by reading a, by reading one contract out of all of these and looking at it and going, well, you know, according to Luminance, something like you know four and a half thousand contracts are you know following this template or in this structure look like this. What is the first one? Let's have a look at the first one. Okay. You know, this seems to be an NDA, right? Let's you know let's apply that. Um, understanding to this. So this is an NDA. What does that tell me about the other NDAs? Well, you know, within this set of NDAs, you've got a standard, which is this one. Something, you know, something like 20% of them follow this standard very closely. There's one over here that looks completely different. So finding standards and deviations. Can you imagine? Right, right. So if you've got that, you know, say you've got 200,000 contracts and you've loaded them in, four and a half thousand of them, you know, follow this, follow this same structure. You know that's an NDA. You apply that to it. Then within that, it starts to say, okay, and here's the standard NDA, and here's the one that's sort of furthest from the standard. You then break it down very quickly. You've effectively read four and a half thousand contracts and it's taken you probably a few minutes. So it's a very, it's a very different way of working yep. but it's very intuitive. Interesting. Yeah, yeah. It reminds me of my, my statistics A-level when we right. have to spot the difference. Statistics, is, yes. Indeed. I'll just give last word to yeah. Victoria on this and then I think there's a question about that. So uh, do you, how, how does um, BCLP <laughs> uh, approach training of AI? Yeah. and. It, what we're looking for is, and it's very tempting to think, and people who are new to AI, it's very tempting to think, okay, let's find one that can do the most out of the box. Let's grab something that's ready to go, and then the next transaction comes in. There'll be no training time. Yeah, we can just crack on and use it. Um, we developed our thinking around that, and actually what we look for is something where, is a tool where we can teach it to be a, a good BCLP um, champion, if you like. Uh, I think it's widely acknowledged that um, legal AI is so widespread now that if we're back here in, in five years' time, everyone in the room will be using AI to a degree. Um, and, and we um, have stopped and thought, look, we, we need to, we would expect to um, have, have a different product. We want to have a BCLP tool. We want to distinguish ourselves by making sure that what the end result we have is not just a, a pure extraction, but it's an extraction in line with our house view on certain points. And that's where that's why the client comes to us rather than yeah. uh, oh, that's, that's, someone else. That's, really that's, a, that's a brilliant area for discussion. The you know how can you personalise the training of your AI system? Um, well, we could talk about this the entire. In fact, after this, if you want to come and sit in the corner with us, we'll talk about AI for all day. With you. <laughs> sure, <we can. laughs> but I have to. But I really would like some questions. So this lady here at the front. Oh, do we have a microphone, by the way? Microphone. Okay, you have to shout. I'm afraid. Oh, there it is. Oh, yeah. one there. There's one. Big oh, okay. Page. We've got about 10 minutes of questions, so um, room for everyone, hopefully. Great, thank you. Hello. Oh. Yeah. Yes? Yes. Some, some. My name is Sofia Barat and I'm Portuguese, and I agree with Emily, but it will depend on the language. I'm Portuguese, and um, lawyers need to have time to learn uh, how to use AI system, and uh, I, I, I'm facing uh, lots of resistance from the other lawyers, and um, we need to teach the, the, the platform, we need to, to uh, identify the documents um, when the documents were uploaded, and we need to tag the clauses, and only after that we can start um, working with the, the, the platforms. Okay, that makes sense. And the the resistance from the partners, how is that happening? No, it's um, they are not clear. They agree with this because they approve this, this kind of projects. But uh, I'm feeling um, they are a lack of sense of urgency, do you know? Yeah. On usage. Absolutely. Yeah. And uh, I... Uh, I would like to know how to overcome this this uh, this situation, yeah. and um, I know this uh, this will be the the, the future, and the, the, there's no way back. And um, I'm feeling that this will be the, the way to overcome the challenges that uh, the legal industry are facing. But in any case, um, 
Yeah. There are two two wishes that we must face: the 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 language training, for yeah. the non-English uh, mm -hmm. lawyers yeah. training, and uh, how to to use uh, IE, to, IE tools when we adopt them because we need time to, to learn our lawyers to do this. Okay, well, let's split that. So, Emily, if you just cover off the language issue again, and then, Victor, if you can talk about how do you get the, the partners on board. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, yeah, so on the language issue, I think, you know, it depends, what, yeah, it depends what you're trying to do and what problem you're trying to solve. But on something like GDPR, for example, you know, we went into organisations, you know, banks and City of London, who had no preconceived idea of what they were looking for in their contracts. It didn't matter what language the contracts are in, they're still able to build their understanding of them faster using AI. So I think to sort of get over that sense of urgency, I think the best thing to do is find an urgent problem. Actually, GDPR was amazing for us because yeah, the problem's right there. You've got to solve it now. And then that meant that there was an impetus to use the technology because there was no alternative. There was no other way. And once the lawyers went into the exercise with that mindset, which is we've got to solve this problem, we need to do this, we're going to do it this way, they then found the technology worked with them really well and it doesn't matter what language you're working in because on something like GDPR there's as much of a blank slate there in English as there would be in Portuguese um, so you know and I think you know it's pattern recognition so you know, regardless of the language it's still pattern so from the computer's point of view it doesn't care what language it is yeah I hope that well, if, if that doesn't make sense we can come back uh, we'll have a chat afterwards mm. so Victoria um, yeah, I, I, I think it's I think it's about um, finding a pain point, mm -hmm. and and the pain point for partners is normally what ends up in their pocket at, at the end of the year. So if you can find a product and you can actually, uh, so you find a problem, um, and you work out how much that problem is is costing your business now, and how much if you can get a sort of trial period to show how much it you could project it to save the business then you're onto a winner and, and then suddenly the urgency to save that money becomes becomes very real and I gave the example earlier of our, our notice reader the, the other one which is now almost w w was certainly is spreading through the market it, it, in England it is is title review so so if you have a, a title at the land registry um, um, and you want to actually extract the information that sits behind a PDF and you want to use that information in different ways and suddenly people are thinking about well hang on a sec that there's ways to do that there's ways for that information to be pulled through in in, in different manners um, um, we started doing that a few years ago and it and and we did it in a way that not only Save money, but it also allowed our system to to see when a um, when a that information was bought from our central land registry. Um, the the system would log it, so the next time someone went to buy exactly that same information, it would come back and say, "Hang on a sec, someone down the corridor bought that last week. You can use that." And so then you've got this twin. Um, commercial saving and that is directly passed on to the client um, information literally there at your fingertips and information in a format that you can kind of slice and dice out into whatever areas of, of the business or the transaction you need mm. and suddenly then I, th I think your, your partners will be listening up and, and seeing multiple benefits and once you've got that thinking accepted and people using those tools it, it spreads much more easily. Uh, absolutely I, I just really want to sort of um, second that from the, all the discussions I have with law firms and general counsel I mean legal technology ironically is not really about the law or technology it's about the production of legal work it is about money economics the shape of the business, the structure of a business. If you think of it in industrial terms, if you go back to the 18th and 19th century, we move from an artisanal world to an industrial world. We found new ways of making things. A lot of that involved people, but we also used a lot of mechanization and automation. And this is where we're heading. Um, the lady there, you had a question. Yeah. Can you get the mic? <laughs> Uh, 
Um, Sue Bentz, um, Slater and Gordon Lawyers. Um, Slater and Gordon are a consumer law firm, so we operate at scale, um, servicing um, consumers um, across the UK. Um, I appreciate that there's lots and lots of people here today who are uh, from commercial uh, law firms and commercial uh, legal service providers. I I'm interested in inspiration around hey, how AI has been used um, to um, enable access to justice in the CLS space, in the consumer legal services space. I know there are some people here from uh, Lee Day, um, that's your space too, um, and there are some others I think that work in our sector. So I'd love to hear some examples of how AI uh, has been seen to be operating um, in, um, in, in the consumer law uh, area. Uh, well, I mean, just well, probably have to have a chat later. There's a whole there's a whole segment of A to J tech, access yeah. to justice tech. Um, a lot of it revolves around rules based expert systems and chatbots. There's one called Rights Now uh, in New York, uh, which advises people through uh, a voice activated chatbot on their civil rights and how they can make a claim. That kind of thing. There's yeah. a whole bunch of stuff there. Yeah. But I don't know, Emily and Victoria. And well, I, I go to quite a few sort of you know government discussions about you know about how that can be done and I think the conclusion we came to in the last session was actually you know it's not necessarily AI that's needed there it's things like you know good interaction design you know good UX you know good um, you know good SEO you know so having a government website which is impenetrable and so you can't work out what the your advice should be mm. is more of a problem than the need for AI and I think you know chatbots I think they're a little bit dangerous in that context because actually you know you do need a human at the end of it and I think you know one thing we're quite evangelical about as an organization is you know, there's always a lawyer involved don't take the lawyer out of the equation we need the lawyer um, and I think those were where the discussions ended up in the last kind of government conversation I had which was actually get the SEO right get the UX right get those things right and you'll do much more in terms of access to justice than introducing AI for the sake of ticking the AI box I think is mm -hmm. you know, the worry yeah, that I had and, yeah but the legal design I don't know if there's any legal design bits today but um, if, you've, if you've not been to a legal design conference, try and go to one, because I think that very much relates to that, because it's all about people who don't understand the law, because yeah. most of the people here are selling between lawyers, aren't they? Uh, Victoria, what do you think? Yeah, I, I, I'd agreed with what um, you've already said, Emily. It, it, I, I think in as much, it's as much about actually firstly telling people that there is a problem here, and, and that's, you can't necessarily do that through AI, um, mm. then giving people access to the conversation before then maybe you're directed off in, into that more automated route. And um, last night I was looking for um, with selling my children's bunk beds on eBay, the joys of a bank holiday, <laughs> um, and uh, I'm missing a little screwy nutty thing that the bolt twists you know one of those really annoying things that you have to line up the hole in the middle yeah. of the wood to yeah and and <laughs> I, could i describe it i could you know i knew what i needed i knew on google on on the internet somewhere there must be thousands of these little things but if if you can't describe your problem yeah mm. you, you you need i needed to phone someone up and say you know that screwy bolt thing yeah. you know and and that's what the consumer needs at that point before they can then go on to ebay and yeah. buy them from china or whatever mm -hmm. um yeah. so so you know we as a firm uh, we don't generally sort of deal with that many consumers face to face but we do go and um, provide you know go, go to the legal um provide legal services through the help I can't, through an advice center um, and do try and get that face to face to, to push people in the right direction. Fantastic. And just see if we got, we've got a couple of minutes. Um, last question, the gentleman at the back there. Hello, my name is Nick White, Tangible IP. Um, a lot of the discussion has been about AI applied to conventional law firms and how their services work. There's a very interesting question over there about access to law. Are there any examples of AI being used to actually improve the quality of the law in the first place? How do you As mean one, the quality of the well, law? Well, how we create law. Because really, the, com the complexity that we're talking about here with the public mm -hmm. is understanding the law, and the law is far too complex. Yeah. So is there any initiatives to try and improve the way we make law? Uh, well, I so think well, I can answer that. I think that is the, the legal design um, sector. Sure. With some tremendous work being done. In fact, uh, later today, I don't know if Richard uh, maybe is in the room. Richard, are you here? 
No. Um, hang around until this afternoon. There's a guy called Richard Moby who will be giving a talk. Hey, there he is. Um, and he, I'm sure he'll be very happy to talk okay. to you about legal design and how that can help. And a quick extra question. Have you got any examples of not just improving the way law, law firms work in conventional ways, but of a step out new service that's been created through the use of AI? Okay, that's a good one. Um, can you create a whole new service line mm -hmm. using an AI system? I think at the end of the day, it's the same. It's the same law. It's the same lawyers. This is something that's helping you do it, you know, in a in a more effective way. Um, so I don't see there being particularly new, new service providers as a result of that. I don't know. It's an interesting uh, question. I, I think there, there's certainly an, an opportunity to commoditize what you do do, and and there may be instances where actually that that allows you access to a client base that you previously hadn't touched um, because, for example, they, they um, know that they can go to the platform. Perhaps they're in a different jurisdiction where they're in a different time zone. That's quite difficult in my firm now because we're everywhere. But um, it, it's so, you, for example, the, the, um, the one that I've seen work very well is um, an AGM builder. So somebody knows they, they need to have an AGM. There are certain steps that you need to go through in order to get there. You might not need to actually talk to a lawyer about that because it's very formulaic, but you might need some hand-holding. So you can go on and buy the AGM builder, um, and it will take you through those steps. And that's the set price. And you know, obviously, that, that firm will then happily help you out and have a one-on-one -on -one conversation and it could lead off in all kinds of directions, but it doesn't necessarily have to. So for those very formulaic processes, yes, absolutely. And you might never see that client. Yeah. Mm, definitely. I will have to end there. I, I would say uh, have a look at expert systems if you'd like a chat about those. People like Neotologic and so forth, that could be up your street. So thank you very much. I